Today I'm on site at Safe Chem, a facility that allows residents to easily drop off household hazardous materials, including lithium ion batteries. I came here expecting to learn about battery disposal, but I quickly realized that they handle far more than just batteries. This facility is fantastic. They're not just doing it right, they're doing it better than most. You found Stashed. I'm Pat, firefighter, mechanical engineer, and battery guy. I'm Pat. Jonathan. Nice to meet you. So Jonathan, you're with the Safe Chem here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Kent County uh, Department of Public Works. And this is actually a household hazardous materials waste drop off, correct? Yep, yep. We will take anything from any household that uh, poses a danger to not only the landfills, but the environment. So residents pull up to the store right here. Do they actually bring the stuff in? Do you come out and get them? No, no. Uh, we ask everyone to stay in their car for safety reasons. Just because they don't have something dangerous doesn't mean the person behind them, you know, doesn't have something dangerous. Uh, so we, ha we they stop, we ask them what they have and where it's at. Uh, if we have any questions, we'll come back and ask them. But usually it's in the trunk. Some people just roll up, pop the trunk, and it's just in a box. We grab it, bring it inside, then kind of process it from there. All right, so from here, everything goes inside. So let's go inside and see what it looks like. So once everything comes inside here, I'm assuming you use these carts, bring everything in here, and you start the sorting mm -hmm. process. What does that look like? So yeah, generally, uh, every, we got everything on the carts. If it's in a box, we uh, will I'll unload the box so you can get a full view and look at everything. Uh, for the most part, every, most of the stuff we get in is flammable. So we usually take it right into the flammable room. Let's take a look inside the flammable um, room and see what you do with it from there. Yeah, so here, uh, Got everything nice and labeled, but we have aerosols, you know, flammable liquids, one gallon containers, five gallon containers. Here's our little one off small things, um, you know, flammable solids like mothballs, uh, fireworks, lighters, and ammunition. We have some more oil based paint. Here's our bulking drums where we bulk fluids. So, motor oil and antifreeze. And then, whenever we're doing gas, we, we grab our respirators. And, you know, anytime this is open, we're masked up just for okay. you know, our own safety. And, uh, so this is stuff that comes in in miscellaneous containers, correct? Yep, yep. Usually old containers, but you, you never know. Um, I've had muriatic acid in an antifreeze bottle before, so you always kind of got to look at what you're doing. Don't take it for what's on the label. You kind of assess the situation before you pour it out. Do you have methods of testing what fluids you're getting into here to kind of know what you have? So context is always the best bet. If um, like, let's say the resident cleaned out their um, father who passed away shed, they don't know what any of the stuff is, but you kind of just look at it. You're like, oh, this guy was a woodworker. Um, probably nothing caustic. It's probably all going to be flammable materials. Sure. Um, we do like a wafting test if we're really unsure, but we also have pH strips if uh, we deem it not to be flammable and need to figure out where it has to go. We'll pH it and go from there. Anything super crazy, our contractors will send a field chemist out and they'll, they'll assess it and determine what kind of hazard. It that is. just kind of gets set aside until you can figure mm -hmm. it out. Yep. Okay. And then I was actually kind of surprised, like the paints and stuff, you still keep those in the in the one gallon jugs. Yep. You don't necessarily empty those out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It it's, makes it a little bit easier. Our contractor does it all on site. They have a big shredder that will just shred it off, take the metal out and then just bulk this paint up. Um, and then I believe they send it to incineration from there. This time of year, we're getting a lot of pesticides. So we set, sort them between liquid and solid. Uh, it okay. could be fertilizer or poison. Our vendor doesn't you know, differentiate the two, so we put them in the same containers. So we do take cooking oil. Uh, that's another weird thing that doesn't have a proper, it, easily disposable route. And that kind of surprises me. I, in my mind, cooking oil would be more of an item that went to the trash, so. I mean, no liquid should ever be going in the garbage, because uh, if they go in your garbage truck, yeah, they're gonna end up on the road, which means they're gonna end up in the water system, so. Yeah, totally makes sense. And th this is one of the things, uh, we used to collect them at multiple satellite locations, but now we just bring it all back here. Now, you mentioned your satellite locations. For the most part, you're not sorting anything at those locations. Some of the stuff is coming back here though, correct? So we do do the same sort, uh, you know, bring it in, separate the flammables, uh, the poisons and the corrosives. Uh, so like the sheds have three distinct rooms. Um, and so we package it and sort it all out, much like we do in this drum for our contractors to come pick it up. We do bring a few things back, um, like batteries that require more processing, you know, cooking oil just for space saving. The same with, um, Mercury containing items. Got it. Actually, there is a pill bottle full of mercury. Wow. Um, 
And this stuff is very expensive to dispose of. So, you know, if you have a wood mounted thermometer, we, we can pop the thermometer off the wood. That way we're not paying an arm and a leg to, for the weight of the wood. So we kind of process it down a little bit, but avoid dealing with loose mercury whenever possible. Okay. Um, and yeah, then here's kind of just the wall of everything else. Um, here we have PCB containing ballast, you know, anything made leaves for before 1985, all those ballasts. All the old light ballasts, mm -hmm. which are quickly going away. Yeah, we've been seeing fewer and fewer of those um, in the past couple of years. And okay. then, you know, fire extinguishers, uh, smoke detectors, sometimes they can go in with electronics, but a lot of these are radioactive. So uh, our vendors have asked that we stop putting them in there. So we have separate waste stream for these. Now, is this all smoke detectors or are you just grabbing out the ionizing ones? Just all smoke detectors because uh, our downstream vendors don't, if they see one, they'll, they'll, they'll uh, sure. bill us for it. Okay. So, and then yeah, cleaners, so pH neutral items. So uh, you know, anything between like seven and nine on the pH scale, we'll put in here. Um, and then, you know, bases nine plus and then station below for the acids now inside of here you just have containers of material it's yeah. not just liquid inside yeah. so you can look you'll see uh some toilet bowl cleaner and some house siding cleaner and okay some uh, different household products mm -hmm. when people clean out their medicine cabinets of like the toothpaste shampoo all, all that kind of stuff that easily all goes in there but uh under the kitchen sink you know you're looking at more the the base container okay uh here's where we kind of look closer at stuff so if we're busy and we're just too slammed or like test what something is we'll set it aside on this cart um we have our ph strips and then a couple of cheat sheets for like pool chemicals and photochemicals so when we do have time we're not rushed and we can take our time to figure out what makes it dangerous and make sure it gets to the right spot all right and if anything happens you know chemical shower eyewash station sure and then oxidizers you know your pool chemicals and other such things and then um, ammonia containing stuff because as i'm sure you, you're aware you should not mix any cleaning products together but especially ammonia with some certain chemicals yeah that makes for some really nasty stuff yeah and you'd be surprised the amount of people that show up with all their stuff just in a garbage bag and everything's leaking all over everything else and they don't think anything's wrong with that so um yeah i wish i yeah. <laughs> was surprised by that but i really i really am not Yep. And then o over here is where we process our batteries. Uh, I do not have any at the moment, but use these bins to kind of sort them out between NICADs, uh, different types of the lithiums. Um, we tape them up and package them into these barrels. Uh, we utilize DDR kits for the damaged lithium cells we get in. Um, so this right here is the uh, cell block material. So this is an expanded glass bead. And what its job is, is to make sure that if there is a fire in one of these batteries, that it doesn't uh, allow it, number one, hopefully it doesn't allow it to extend to the other batteries, but it also keeps everything inside of this container and yeah. it keeps it a lot safer. And uh, they're, the packing instructions are very specific. You need to keep everything uh, at least a half inch away, layer the cell block at least a half inch deep between layers. So um, they, they fill up pretty quick, but it's it's really nice peace of mind knowing that if anything does happen, it, it will be contained, especially during transit. And, and with the cell block, it makes it a lot easier because without the cell block, if you just go based on the standard DOT shipping requirements mm -hmm. for DDR batteries, it's a single battery cell in a single container. So it's very inconvenient and almost impossible to ship yep. DDR batteries. And I go a step above, I tape them before I bag them just for any extra, uh, just peace of mind knowing that it's as, it's in an airtight pouch in a bag wrapped in cell block. So uh, I can sleep at night not thinking, is there a fire going on at work? Uh, right. And we do have a thermometer that will check these uh, in the mornings and at the end of the day, just to make sure no nothing seems hotter than it should be. One of the things that I really frustrated with is y you guys have a great setup for collecting mm -hmm. batteries. Most of the US that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And if they do take batteries, they're only gonna take the, the actual you know, good end of life batteries that aren't damaged. Uh, the DDR completely hands off because yep. of the extra steps. And it, it, there is a lot of extra steps when it comes to shipping DDR batteries. Yes. And like this one uh, we got on Tuesday, it caught fire and the person dropped it off to make sure we took it. And I'm like, always will, but they, uh, I mean, these are no joke. And, no, not at all. Uh, and that's what 
personally, I have issues with unmanned battery collections because when you're dropping NICADs on the swollen uh, polymer batteries, that's when you sure. have problems. Sure, and I see it all the time. Mm -hmm. The other part about this, which I, I definitely appreciate, is it looks like you're treating all these right. You're taping all the terminals as mm -hmm. far as processing goes. You are making sure that they're, they're not damaged and everything's going in here properly. Uh, one thing that surprised me is just the number of tool batteries. It seems mm -hmm. like all the end-of-life batteries are mostly tool batteries, what I'm seeing in all these locations. Is that kind of what you're seeing as well? Yeah, we get, I mean, they're the biggest, easiest ones. Um, and, you know, they'll, they're the main rechargeable battery that the households have that when they die, they're going to do something with it. Uh, most people don't buy AA, AAA rechargeable batteries. So most in the house, the only rechargeable batteries you have are tool batteries or power bricks for your phone. So um, it is interesting. When I started, we were filling the lithium and the NICAD barrels like at the same rate, but that's completely changed. It's primarily all lithium now, and it's a slow trickle of the other rechargeable kinds we get. If we keep moving along mm -hmm. here, we've got different electronics here. I'm assuming that it's lead acid. Yep, lead acid batteries. Um, and then these we kind of just sort out um, just for pricing reasons, like we get you know, a better deal on computers and then if we just mix them in the miscellaneous electronics. So we pull out any computers or laptops, they go in here. Now, are you removing the batteries from these or are you no. shipping these as if it's is? in there, uh, it's in there. Uh, if, they're, if they're swollen, uh, we'll, we'll pull them out uh, sometimes. But for the most part, it's if it's complete, it, they want them complete because they're able to, recy our recycler will, you know, take parts or do what they will with the computers after we send them to them. So it's more beneficial for them if the whole thing's you know, all in one piece. Now, do you get any cell phones or anything like that? Yeah, actually back by the batteries, I have a barrel of cell phones and a barrel of tablets that we set, sort those out too for the same reasons. Just all right. they're valuable. So it just helps, um, you know, cut down the cost of disposal. If we have something that they actually pay us for going out with it, it'll kind of just even out. So we're pretty much getting free electronics recycling. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is even though we are inside and there's you know, definitely a bit of a hazard with the lithium ion batteries. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a suppression system up there. So that's yep. definitely going to help save some of the infrastructure and, and keep things in check if something goes wrong. So I feel like uh, most buildings aren't designed to contain this kind of material when they were built. This building was. Um, everything in here is shock resistant, uh, like the cameras, all the outlets. No, no shocks can come out of those. There's a blast wall over there. There's a two hour firewall in the flam room. So this building was designed in the event of something happening, it will be as contained as possible. So this area right here is really just the miscellaneous stuff that comes mm -hmm. in that ne isn't necessarily hazardous, but really not good for your equipment either. Um, for example, uh, all these cores and stuff like this. If this were to go into the regular recycling, what would happen over there? It would just get tangled up in all the, the belts and uh, usually the drum feeder is where it all gets stuck. So in this, uh, we would cut a lot of these cords off of the electronics to help, sub, you, know, you know, cutting costs, if you will. Just an e easy way to just save a little bit of money to cut the cords. And then same with the scrap metal. A lot of what we get in, it's considered an electronic, but you take a vacuum cleaner, there's no circuitry in there. It's just a motor. That's just scrap metal. So it's uh, scrap metal bin. We don't openly accept scrap metal, but we have a spot for it just because we get so much of it coming in. Okay. And then trash and cardboard. I'm yep. sure just things come in in cardboard boxes all the time. Yeah, we uh, we send empty out all these about twice a week. Um, and then anything that we pour out in our uh, flammable room, we drain it well enough to we're able to actually recycle those plastic jugs and containers next door. Okay. We do have a spot for uh, fluorescent lights. You know, four foot, eight foot, uh, smaller ones. And then a problem I've had recently is uh, nitrous oxide tanks. Okay. Uh, these are more and more, we're seeing these coming in, uh, whether from somebody who's using them and just needs to clean them out or uh, an upset friend who's taken away from their friend who's abusing and misusing uh, those products. So that's, this has been a big one in the past year is all those nitrous tanks. Is there anything you ever get here that you can't accept? Well, can't accept isn't the right word. Uh, extremely dangerous is probably the right word because uh, 
that's the whole point of this program is to take this kind of stuff in. Sure. But we did uh, receive a cannonball a few weeks ago, which uh, was definitely on the top 10 most dangerous things I've seen in this job to the point where we had to call the police and the bomb squad had to come out. We had to shut the collection down, evacuate this building, shut down the recycling center next door. And uh, unfortunately, when they picked it up and x-rayed it with the Michigan State Police Bomb Squad, they couldn't conclusively tell if it was still live or not, which kind of was a bummer and I was looking for an answer on that. I'm sure that's pretty unique. Have you had any other issues with explosives coming in? The most explosive things we've gotten outside of the cannonball are just, um, you know, undeployed airbags from vehicles, which is something sure. we will accept. Um, and then I have gotten picric acid before. I don't know if you're familiar with picric acid. No. Uh, so it's a chemical compound that when it dries out, it crystallizes and those crystals um, are pressure sensitive and will explode. Okay. So they'll dry out in the cap of the lid, and if you go to open it, you'll it'll, it'll explode. Um, That'd be a little and, bit uh, surprising, I'm sure. Yeah, you don't see that stuff often. I've only seen it once. I think Isaac before me saw it once or twice. Yeah. Um, and it's usually coming out of uh, we call it the dead chemist stash, where you know your dad was a tinker in his pole barn and spent 50 years amassing chemicals, and then when they finally bring it all to you, you actually need a licensed chemist to come out and sort through it because it's such a mess and in in that stuff you got some really dangerous uh you know picric acids and then we had some radioactive material come in with that load as well so all right so one thing that i saw was unique is you have kind of a, a bit of a shop here that's free for residents can you tell me a little bit more about that yeah so uh our swap shop it's set up just for anything that still has some life left in it we feel bad just wasting it by paying for disposal so we set up uh this is actually a brainchild of our uh, director who's always wanted to do this. So when they built this space, they ensured that we had a uh, room where we could give stuff away. And it's really anything good that comes in, half full bottles of Windex, spray paint cans, unopened things of motor oil, whatever it is, we, we set it aside here. Okay. Uh, and then uh, whenever we have time, we'll, we'll weigh it up based on its category and uh, we'll, we'll track all those numbers and then we'll, we'll stock it into the swap shop. Let's walk in here real quick. So all this stuff in here is free for any, any of the residents to use then? Yeah, yeah, all they have to do is fill out a waiver, you know, that way they can't sue us if the wiper fluid gives them a flat tire. Um, that's really all we ask and just to also keep in mind other people use this, so um, don't, don't take way more than you need. Uh, it's, the stuff's not going anywhere. So, but yeah, anyone who can come in while we're open to drop off, uh, just come in here. They can take what they want and they just fill out a waiver. Then we track that information and compare it with uh, the waste we put in. That way we have an idea of how much money we're saving. Uh, everyone, at least last year who came in here, on average saved us, uh, I believe it was $17 in disposal cost. And we saved about $30,000 roughly in disposal cost by just giving this stuff away when it still had some life left in it. And that's, that's great for the residents here. And hopefully they, a lot of them know about it, take advantage of it. Again, this is a model, I think, for all communities. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good work being done here as far as collecting the household hazardous waste, disposing of it properly, especially the batteries. Uh, we need more programs like that across the U.S., but really across Michigan for mm -hmm. sure. I'd love to see it, something uh, more thorough in, in all the communities. Yeah, well, I frequently am getting phone calls from people outside of Kent County wanting to utilize our service. and. Um just because they, they have the once a day year for all this stuff and they, they're out of town that weekend and we're more than happy to help them out. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a need uh, for more communities to be able to not necessarily have this level of infrastructure, but just have a convenient way for the disposal of these hazards. Because if it's not easy, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go in the garbage, it's going to catch on fire and then we're having a problem. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Appreciate you showing me around. Yeah. Do, do you need any spray paint? <laughs> I think I'm all set for right now.